can't hold the microphone because it makes me feel like a rock star. <laughs> That's actually relevant to the talk. So I'd like to begin with a story. Uh, unfortunately, it's not funny. It's not. In the times of the Roman occupation, there were ten great sages who were martyred. One of them was Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. And after he found out that he was going to be beheaded, he was sitting with his friend and colleague, Rabbi Yishmael. Rabbi Yishmael also knew that he was going to be martyred too. The, 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 uh, the sentence had been passed. Rabbi Yishmael was going to have it worse than Rabbi Gamliel, because Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, because Rabbi Yishmael had to first of all had to see his friend killed, then he was going to have his skin flayed from him while he was alive, and then he'd be killed. And they were sitting, wondering, why do they deserve this fate? Imagine the scene. I picture Rabbi Shimon lamenting through his tears and says, how could this be happening to me? What have I done? What's my capital offense? Did I violate the Sabbath? It's a capital offense in Jewish law. Did I, am I a sexual deviant? Am I an idolater? I'm a murderer? What am I that I deserve this? Somewhat audaciously, Rabbi Yishmuel, his co-accused, says, well, let's think about it. What have you done? Maybe once upon a time you were having a feast with your friends, and some poor people came to the, the house, knocked on the door, and they were turned away. Maybe, maybe something like that happened. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel said that would never have happened. I was, I was very stringent. Whenever I had a feast in my house, I appointed guards. I put them on the door. I, made them, I told them to look out for waifs and drifters. If you say a wave or a drifter, invite them in. And they would come and they'd sit at my table, they'd eat with me, they'd drink with me, and we'd bless, we'd bless God together over the food. So then Rabbi Ishmael thought, well, if it's not that, maybe it's something else. You, you Rabbi Shimon, you were the head of the judiciary, the great Sanhedrin. Maybe when you were sitting on your throne, on the Temple Mount, in judgment to the Jewish people. Maybe your ego swelled. There was a silence. It filled the room as Rabbi Shimon became reconciled to his fate. So I was asked to give my Jewish talk, okay? That story has always <coughs> echoed in my ears ever since I heard it. I find that story shocking, profoundly shocking. But I said, I'm going to talk about why do I teach? What would I want to tell the Jewish people if I had the opportunity to speak to all of them? And I've only got 10 minutes. What would I talk about? I'd talk about me. <laughs> it's one of my favorite topics of conversation. I know a lot about it. Why do teachers teach? Why do I get up, in he up here in front of you? Why does anyone do that? Well, I can only speak for myself. And it's not a pleasant truth. I stand up here because it's the biggest ego boost going. I love it. You're all looking at me. Are you? You're listening to me. You're all listening to me. And it feels great to be invited to share this stage with some of the most greatest educators, to stand up here for 10 minutes addressing a packed auditorium, it's validation. It's affirmation. It feels great. So the first reason that I'm standing up here is because I'm full of myself. I feel that I should be listened to. And this is like some sort of sick wish fulfillment. But I'm also severely lacking in self-esteem. <laughs> Paradoxically, I love myself, I think I'm great, I want to talk, I want to be listened to. And yet, the very fact that I want to be listened to, doesn't that indicate that I'm not really so secure? I need it. I need the affirmation. And after every lecture, every lecture I've given so far at the mud, I rerun every word in my head, wishing I'd said things differently. I wonder, well, four or five people came up to me and said it was good. Does that mean that everyone else hates me? <laughs> Something I've realised teaching at the mud, and at the mud fest, as opposed to the teaching I do in yeshiva or university or elsewhere, is that while I'm here, all of my classes are kind of about me, and they're basically just therapy. 
<laughs> look at me now, right? I'm just talking about myself. You are basically my psychologist and I should be paying you, right? <laughs> I hope you don't have a high fee because I'm studying in Colel and we don't get paid very well. We don't get paid. Um, <laughs> so I teach for the pleasure of it. I teach for the ego boost. I teach for the affirmation. I teach for the therapy. I am basically Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel. And so disappointed was he in himself that he thought he deserved his terrible fate. So, in my 10 minutes in front of you, the Jewish people, I think I'd bear my soul. I think I've done that already. And I tell them that I worry. I worry. Do, do I teach for my own glory, or do I teach for the glory of God and the glory of the Torah? And I'd ask them to be honest with me too. Honest with themselves. When you learn Torah, when you do a mitzvah, when you go to shul on a cold winter morning, to make up a minion for a mourner who wants to say Kaddish, do you do it for the glory of the Torah? Do you do it to serve the Lord your God? Do you do it for the sake of the mourner in his hour of need? Or do you do it because learning Torah is stimulating? Do you do it because the mitzvah gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling? Do you do it because you know that one day, God forbid, you're going to need a minion, so you might as well, you know, do, do them the favour now so they'll owe you one? Perhaps I'm being unfair, right? Unfair to you and unfair to me. Because there's a certain tension in what I'm saying. In the story with which I began, I think there's kind of a, a hidden dimension lurking underneath. And we need to bring it out. Teaching is hard. Teaching hurts. Here I am, in a sense, exposing myself. You might think now that you know me a little bit. You might think that you understand what I'm saying. But how can you understand what I'm saying, given that I don't really understand what I'm saying? What I'm trying to say is, by teaching, by opening up to you, I'm opening myself up to the possibility of misinterpretation. Let me give you an example. Right? At Limud Fest, in the summer, I spoke on a panel. On that panel, at one point I mentioned how I'm a committed Orthodox Jew. I explained that, as I understand it, my orthodoxy rules out the possibility of pluralism. I'm not a pluralist. What does that mean? That means I believe that Orthodox orthodoxy, broadly speaking, whatever that word actually means, because no one really knows, that that's the right interpretation of Judaism, whatever that really means, because no one really knows. That certain interpretations of Judaism are wrong, and that certain interpretations of Judaism are right. That just follows from my not being a pluralist. By some I was interpreted as saying that certain ways of life are illegitimate, that certain people are less Jewish than others, that people don't have a right to disagree with me, that I look down on those who differ from me. The fact that anyone could think such a thing about me, that hurts. Because my greatest love besides that for my, for my wife and my family is for my people, the Jewish people. And I believe that on certain issues I'm right and that others are wrong, but I know that I have to be open to discussing these things with others, open to being convinced, just as you should be open to discussing things with me, being convinced, having a conversation. Dialogue. To be at the mood is to be constantly exposed to the fact that orthodoxy does not have a monopoly on religiosity. Some of my most powerful role, role models in this room, exemplars of the love and fear of God, are not orthodox. The idea that people could go away thinking that I'm a bigot whose heart is closed to any subsection of my people, that's a notion that hurts me. In fact, even in this conference, I've overheard conversations in which I was being misquoted, because I gave a session and I heard people talking about it, and they weren't getting me right. <laughs> Maybe I just shouldn't have spoken. That would have been safer. Teaching is hard. So is learning Torah. So is doing mitzvot. So is waking up in the morning on a cold winter's day to go and say Kaddish for your friend. So go and help your friend say Kaddish, right? If we didn't enjoy it, if we didn't get something tangible from it, However superficial, we, we, would, we just wouldn't continue. We need to enjoy it. Otherwise, we just wouldn't do it. It's too hard. This talk really shouldn't be about me. It should be about God, and I know that sometimes I confuse them too. <laughs> but really, so let me paint a picture of the world. The world through the eyes of Rabbi Shimshon Rainfall Hirsch, the author of the 19 Letters. 
He looked at the natural world, the world minus the human race, as a chain of constant reciprocal activity. In essence, he was preempting the notion of an ecosystem, in which every single element is essential for the preservation of the whole. The lion may look greedy and cruel as he tears into the baby antelope, but in a sense, they are both pre-programmed to be completely generous, in the sense that by occupying their place in the food chain and the ecosystem, they're contributing to the preservation of the whole. And thus, Rav Hirsch related to God as the conductor of a cosmic orchestra, in which every creation plays its part in beautiful harmony with everything else. But the instrumentalists in this particular orchestra are more like pre-programmed robots than musicians. They play exactly as they're told to. The human species is different. Like a gifted soloist, the human has a certain freedom. She never plays the same piece exactly in the same way. Each time she plays it, it's invested with a new emotional reality. She, she isn't a robot, she's free. But because of that, she also has the ability to play a completely different piece of music to the orchestra. She could ruin the whole harmony. She could play whatever she likes. She could just make her piano go <laughs> And thus, she's the pinnacle of creation. And also, she's creation's greatest potential enemy. Elements of the natural world can't help but contribute to the world beyond them, but we have a choice, and too often we're too greedy. Rav Hirsch was perhaps the first eco-rabbi. He was aware that if we don't give up on our insatiable greed, we will destroy the world. The humble blade of grass is constantly contributing to its surroundings. Some days, my biggest contribution to the world around me is the size of my carbon footprint. The sole purpose of Judaism, according to Rabbi Hirsch, is essentially to educate ourselves and the world that we need to give up on greed, we need to stop serving ourselves, we need to be a constant blessing to our surroundings, to our social surroundings, and to our environmental surroundings. We need to rise above the cult of the self. And so, given this chance to address the entire Jewish people, I want to tell them just two things. The first is I want to share with them my need constantly to reassess my own motivations for acting. Of course I enjoy my Judaism and I should enjoy my Judaism, my teaching and my learning, but I have to keep assessing, why am I doing it? Am I doing it for the world around me, for my God? Is the enjoyment a welcome and essential accompaniment? Or is it all about self-worship? Because this is fun. Secondly, I want to leave you with a more positive message, and this is what I'll finish with. I want to tell you all that self-love can be a tremendous vehicle for progress, irrespective of what I've said, and I'll tell you why. I have a profound sense of God's love for me. It's a sense that accompanies me throughout my life. Perhaps I learned a sensitivity to the music of God's love for me because my parents, they never were afraid to show me their love. Some parents, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to be too, you don't want to give your children too much love. It kind of looks soppy. My parents were never like that. They showered with me, me with love, and I think, that, I think that made me sensitive to the love that God has for me. And given that I know how much God loves me, given as a parent I know how much I love my children, I have some sort of inkling as to how much God must love all of you. I have some sort of inkling as to how much God must love non-Jews as well, inanimate objects, the world the universe, the whole thing's teeming with love, God's love is infinite. And if that's how you feel, then the desire to teach isn't necessarily uh, all about ego. It's about loving yourself and loving others, wanting to be heard because you're confident of your position, but also wanting to listen to others. We are all isolated selves who want to be heard, just like God who says, Shema Yisrael, listen to me. Thank you.